Today, my guest is Beth Azor. Uh, Beth is a owner of commercial real estate, a uh, commercial real estate firm. Uh, she's a developer, uh, national trainer of leasing agents, and she's also an author. She wrote uh, a book, uh, Why Women Are Afraid to Invest and How Overcoming That Fear. Uh, and, and then also, uh, she's also an expert on retail, uh, on how it's not dead, and also how to uh, fill a vacancy. And in just a minute, we're going to speak with Beth about women investors and uh, how to find out uh, if they are afraid of investing. Uh, but first, I want to remind you, if you like the show CREPN Radio, please let us know. We would love to hear from you. You can like, you can share, and you can subscribe. And like I said, uh, leaving a comment uh, is always welcome. We'd love to hear from our, our uh, listeners and our viewers. Also, if you'd like to see how attractive our guests are, uh, be sure to check out our YouTube channel. And you can do that at Commercial Real Estate Pro Network. Uh, with that, I want to welcome my guest, Beth. Welcome to CREPN Radio. Thanks, Darren, for having me. Well, I am uh, delighted to have you, and I'm looking forward to our talk today. Uh, before we get started, if you could just take a minute and share with the listeners a little bit about your background. Absolutely. I My parents were in residential real estate, so when I turned 18, like most children of people in residential real estate, I got my real estate license. And all during uh, college, I would work as maybe a waitress or a hostess in restaurants, but also on the weekends or during the day sat open houses. So made some extra side hustle money all through college. And then when I graduated, I got a job as a special events director for a not-for-profit, but was only making $11,000 a year, which Darren, that would be like today making 32. And I needed to do something on the weekends to supplement my income, which of course I turned to real estate. After two years at the Heart Association, I went from 11,000 to, to 23,000, which was fabulous. I doubled my income, but I, had a, I was doing the real estate on the weekends the whole time. I had a very wise boss who came to me and said, we love you, but your ambition exceeds us. And you should probably do this not-for-profit thing as a volunteer and go do the real estate gig full-time. So I took her advice and I did that. I was kind of tired of working seven days a week by then while I watched all my friends go out partying on the weekends. And I switched it up and I went to do the real estate gig full-time. And I was sitting in a trailer in a luxury residential home development reading people magazines. And that just did not cut it for me. And I went to the developer and I said, you know, we need to do events or we need to do marketing. And he said, no, 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 we've built luxury homes, you know, just sit in the trailer reading the magazines and when people come in, sell them. And I thought this is not gonna work. And after about six months, someone I met said to me, you should get into leasing or you should get into commercial real estate. And I said, ah, oh, gross that's worse than this. That's like selling land. How much more boring could that be? And she said, no, there's this thing called leasing and developers build shopping centers with grocery stores and small mom and pops come in and you help them open their first bagel shop, dry cleaner, um, clothing store. And then you become part of the family because you help them achieve their American dream. And I said, I'm sold, sign me up. So I joined a firm in Miami where they did had a training program. I was there 18 years. I grew through the company. When I joined the company, there were 11 of us. And I, when I left the company, there were 125. And I was the president the last six years I was there. Wow. And I went out on my own in 2004 because I was a single mom and um, of a four-year-old. And I couldn't run a company and be a president of a large firm and be a good mom. So I... Wasn't sure what I was going to do, but I knew I wanted to not work 80 hours anymore and actually see my son. So I left and probably was semi-retired for about six months. I was the kindergarten room mom and I went back to school and took a couple classes and I got involved philanthropically again. And I knew I wanted to buy um, real estate. I had been investing with my partner at that firm that I was the president of but he always was leading the charge. He was the one finding the deals and I just kind of put some money in it. Um, I wanted to go do that and lead the charge on my own account. So my goal was to 
buy a deal uh, one every two years uh, starting in 04. So, and then at the same time that that was going on, I started getting the phone call from larger companies around the country saying, you know, you've been teaching leasing agents how to lease space your whole career, because that's what I did at, my, at that business that I ran. Why don't you come up to Detroit or LA or Atlanta and teach our leasing agents? So I created this side business of teaching leasing agents how to fill vacancies in mostly shopping centers, but also office buildings and industrial. Wow. That's a uh, power packed uh, resume there. That's impressive. I, uh, hats off to you and, and your success. Thank you. Um, you know, I want to talk to you about, uh, the, the women investors, but before we do that, um, uh, the leasing thing, I'm just kind of curious with your experience in that, because I, I've talked to a few people about retail and what you read and there's, you know, there's plenty that's been written about how re retail is dead. And I've talked to others that's no, it's, changing you know it's it's more about uh the amazon effect and you know something that that uh people can't get online is kind of the the answer uh, right. i'd be curious to hear i mean just kind of your your overview on on just that that situation because you know there's there's plenty of uh like malls and stuff and and i don't know if that's just in areas that have been overbuilt that have gone dark uh you know and and uh but just in retail in general can you speak a little bit to yeah, absolutely, Darren. So retail's not dead, but definitely bad retail is dead. So when I talk about this, I say that retail is being be, retail space is being filled now with the five new F words. Uh, and don't get worried. Uh, yeah. <laughs> here, here they are: food, fun, fitness, physicians, and furniture. So, and there's a play on a play on the word on the letters there with physicians, but medical, fitness, boutique, food, you know, restaurants. For the first time in the history of our country, of our world, actually, uh, restaurant revenues are exceeding grocery sales for the first time ever, and that mm. goes back to time, you know, with double working, you know, dual dual income uh, in every family, mostly. Time is such a commodity that everyone is, is either ordering in with Uber Eats or going out to eat. Very, you know, there's a very small percentage of people that are actually cooking. And it, I think it just so it goes down to time and, and friction. You know, the, the, the fact that you've got to go shop or maybe you have a grocery service that brings the food to your house, you still have to make the food. And when everyone's short on the one commodity of time, if they can order in, and do their homework while they're waiting for the delivery, you know, their kids' homework, or spend time with their kids' quality time, or spend time walking their dog, or going to the gym instead of cooking. I think that's um, supporting that that new stat. But fun, you, you're seeing a lot of what we're we're calling competitive socializing. So that's the barcade, which is the arcade with alcohol or axe throwing places or escape games where this millennial generation, you know, they're so, they've been stuck on their computers and their phones forever. They like to go out and have experiences with their friends, but they like it to be competitive. So there's this whole genre called competitive socializing. And then kids, kids things like the bounce houses and the eye flies and, you know, all of these types of gaming opportunities for them as well. So it's the five F words and you're right. It, every one of them has to do with an experience or with an activity that they cannot get on the internet. You know, the, the um, retail uh, example of clothing, you know, that, that went by the wayside with Walmart, Target and Amazon. There's no more clothing stores, very few clothing stores, except for Ross Dress for Less and TJ Maxx these days. There used to be three to five shoe stores in every strip center, certainly the malls. And uh, Amazon's biggest seller is shoes because when they bought um, Zappos, uh, their, right. sh their shoe revenue went through the roof. So if it's a product, um, you know, like Toys R Us, they had a great opportunity. Toys R Us could have been the biggest experiential format ever but they didn't, you know, they, they, they leveraged, they had, you know, uh, leverage, uh, leverage uh, with 
um, private equity and they didn't have leadership that were thinking about what could they do to provide an experience in the store. And as a mom, now my kids are 19 and 16, but we were in Toys R Us all of the time. The opportunities that they blew to have an experience in toy stores uh, was, was a travesty. Yeah. So, so bad retail is dead. If you know, no one, service, time and service, you know, Outback, my son works at Burger King. So I go to pick him up and I'm parked and I look where I parked at the Burger King, I can look at an Outback. And a year ago, Outback had two mobile pickup spaces outside their side door. They now have 12. Wow. That is a, that's a corporate decision to take 12 parking spaces. Close to the building. Close yeah. to the building. Yeah. And my, my other son works at TGI Fridays. And he says that there's three people in the back kitchen in an area that they built out a, in, by a side door that only handles to-go orders during the week between 11 and 2. That just floored me. I, I said, for, it just floored me that, that there are three employees dedicated to just to-go. So those are the kind of stats that I like, I, I listen to, and, I, and I, I own six shopping centers now, and I go to my, re, my local restaurants. I have a restaurant guy that has seven, he's a sub shop, and he does about 75% more in revenue than a typical Subway, and he has seven locations. And I, I called him up and I said, Harry, I'm, you know, he, my tenants all the time ask for reserved parking spaces in front of their stores, and I always say, no way. I'll say, I'll give you, I'll put a 10 minute parking only sign up, but I'm not going to give you a reserve space. By watching what's going on in the restaurant industry and with this to go, how this revenue, and, and it, you know, it started with Starbucks with the whole mobile to go. When they first op started this mobile to go and they had this parking space that said mobile to go, I said, who is going to park, not go through the drive through run in and get their coffee? Well, 25% more in revenue is going to do that. Yeah. So, and that's reported. So I called my guy, Harry, and I said, Harry, I will give you your own reserve parking space, but you need to create an app for your customers to have, you know, a mobile to go option. So he's yet to do that, but I put it on the table. No, it's fascinating you say that because I know even just the other day I was having coffee and while I'm sitting there with my, uh, you know, friend and, and I'm watching all these people that are walking, they're walking right past the counter to this, this little space where these drinks are already made up. They're grabbing their drink and they're running out. And the interaction that, you know, the, the, just the, with the clerk and all that, or the you know, person behind the counter and waiting to have it made and all that, that's all gone. It's all a matter of you. Friction. It goes, it yeah. still it goes back to time and people don't want friction. If you can remove friction in your business, you will win every time. People don't want, the, it, we live in such an instantaneous society. Anytime, you know, just think about it. If you are online and you're trying to order something, if there's any kind of friction, you just, you know, escape out and move on. Right. Um, hey, one, one kind of a question on that uh, mobile, uh, or not the mobile kitchen, but I, I'm trying to think of it in a way. So the, the revenue that you're seeing these um, restaurants increase based on the, the, what do they, do you call it carry out or to yeah, go or eats mobile or to go, yeah. mobile to go? Um, has anybody experimented with more of like just a, a, uh, a facility that's just a kitchen that you lease to multiple type yes. of restaurants? Yes. Actually, Uber, Travis from Uber is opening up, I think I've read 10, what they're calling ghost kitchens in major markets. And now Grubhub is following suit. So they're called ghost kitchens. They're, again, they're in uh, metropolitan cities where there's a lot of daytime population, hospitals, businesses, office buildings, high rises. They're in, in, but they, they don't want to pay high priced rents. So they want to find a nearby maybe industrial area that they can get to quickly, like via Uber. And it'll be 10 different chefs or restaurants in one space no, no employee, you know, the, the only employees will be the chefs and then the delivery people. There will be no seats there. No one will be eating there. You won't even know it's a ghost kitchen. There won't be any signage. And, and Travis from Uber is, is, I think I've read he's signed 10 leases. 
No, I, I, it just makes sense to me that if, if the people are, they want the food, but they're not necessarily looking to go eat at the place. I mean, that was always kind of the, you know, I guess the, the appeal for a restaurant was to go out and not be at home, you know, kind of thing. But now it seems like everybody's made their home kind of their castle, but they don't want to mess the, don't want to mess the castle up. So, you know, or, or right. spend the time, you know, cooking there. So. I mean, I think, I think, I don't think restaurants are going away. Um, but I do, I just think that I read a stat and I don't, I don't have the exact numbers, but something like in India, there's over $2 billion of revenue in food to go orders. And in China, it's like 1.8 and, and we're still like 400 million. So I think wow. that, that we, I think that the restaurant operators or people in the food industry are watching those stats in China and India. Now they have, you know, significantly more people than we do, but I think people are watching that and saying, Hmm, we've got a long way to go, but if they're doing it, and if, if, the, if the trend is that way, you know, people follow trends. I mean, trends, that, that significant revenue. So when I hear those stats of China and India, and I see that Outback goes from two parking spots to 12, and my son tells me that Fridays adds three people between 11 and two to just handle the kitchen to go orders. It's, I find that fascinating. No, agreed. Agreed. Um, I want to shift gears here. I uh, wanted to speak with you about your book. Um, so I have two books. Oh, you do? Okay. I do. I just, my first one's called Don't Say No for the Prospect. Okay. And the second one is the Retail Leasing Playbook. Okay. Now, how did I think that you were, you'd written a book about women investing was that uh, just a topic or was that I think that's a topic I'm, I'm holding okay. an event in January that's called this the commercial real estate investment symposium for women and I have a private LinkedIn group for women who invest in commercial real estate and what I'm the reason I'm holding the event is because my private LinkedIn group I have in I have posts after posts after posts of women that are communicating that they're afraid to invest. And I see it. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with bigger pockets, right? Yep. Yep. So I have a girlfriend who went to their conference in Nashville a few months ago and she came back and I said, so I'm curious, tell me about the demographic makeup of the room. And she said, well, she didn't have the exact stats, but she said, I think there were about 2000 people in the room. And she said there were about 95% men. And she said, and of the women I met, they were spouses of the men. And I, as a woman investor with six shopping centers worth over $80 million, uh, and I have families and friends that are partners, the majority of my family and friends that are partners are men. And I am constantly talking to women about why are you not dipping your toe in the water and investing. And I keep hearing reasons why they're not. And I've just, I decided to hold this symposium in January because I'm going to have eight women that are on, gonna be on the dais, including myself, who have invested, who are going to speak to how we've invested, how we found the deal, how we raised the money, how we got the loan and how we, and one of my speakers is going to be a woman, my luncheon speaker is going to be a woman that is going to talk about overcoming limiting beliefs because all of the fears that these women are sharing with me that's stopping them from investing, I believe 95% has to do with their limiting beliefs. Well, let's talk about that. Cause I, I mean, the, the numbers, um, I I would be surprised. I mean, even when you, you mentioned your own investing, the majority of the, the family and friends that are invested with you are, are men. Um, do you, do you think that it's uh, a matter of exclusion? Like, like the, uh, if these people are a couple and they defer uh, to their, their male uh, partner, or is it a matter of uh, they don't want to, I mean, is it really fear or is it just a matter of, of a, like a delegation kind of a thing of you take care of this, I'll take care of that. 
or how do you, if you can tell me what you think on that? So I think that it's a combination. So there's a lot of women that are not married or not in relationships mm -hmm. that aren't investing. So, okay. you know, there, you know, it's, is, I don't know, 50% of the population. Why would only 5% of women attend the bigger pockets? So why weren't there 30% women there? So I, I, what I find when I, when I post on my link, my, this private group where women can feel co comfortable sharing their, you know, innermost fears is they say things like, I'm not good at the numbers. It's too complicated. I'm afraid. I don't, you know, know where to go for guidance. If I run into a problem, I was told, you know, that I'm, that I'm not smart enough. I mean, these are the things that these women are saying and it's heartbreaking because a lot of it's in their mind. You know, I, I am, I was literally, I went to a Catholic parochial grade school growing up and I'll never forget that in my second grade parent teacher meeting, Sister Christine said to my parents, Beth will always be great at English and history, but probably math and science are not her things. I will never forget that. And in fact, my, my college uh, degree was in English literature. <laughs> now, when I joined uh, this real estate company, I felt the need to, and even my boss at the time, who was a phenomenal mentor and got me involved in investing, you know, and that's another story I'll share with you, which is phenomenal. But he also was very negative about, you know, me and my understanding of numbers. So what did I do? I took classes and educated myself and overcame that. And now I'm very confident. But to this day, if I'm buying a deal, I many times will pay and outsource the underwriting. I'll underwrite it my way. And then I'll, ha I'll hire an underwriting firm to underwrite the deal to, to just to check my numbers. Is that insecurity? A little bit. And it comes from, I'm 59 years old, you know, 50 years of hearing things that it's a limiting belief. And I own $80 million worth of real estate and have owned more in, in the past. So, um, I, and I, you know, in the, you, you, there's a story um, that people share. I think it's, a, I don't know, it's either Harvard or, or MIT. There's, there's like a study where they say that men, if there's a job, that is um, posted, a man, whether he thinks he is capable or qualified for the job, will go in and apply for the job, even if he f believes he's 30% capable. A woman will not apply for the job unless she feels that she's 98% qualified. Right. That, I think, is exactly, men will just go and say, let me go try it. And I think women are fearful. They're fearful of um, not knowing. They're fearful of, they're scared of failing. They're fearful of taking risk. And I think that there's more men in the world that they have stronger self-confidence and egos and will just take the risk. I, that, I don't have any scientific facts on that. Just I, I see it in my day-to-day. -day. I, I know I, I take a group of women every year we go on a trip and I have about last, we were in Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky in October, we had 47 women and only three of us are investors. And I, I talked all weekend about investing to these women. And I kept hearing the same thing. It's scary. It's risky. Numbers aren't my thing. Too complicated. Well, let me ask you, so are they invested in other ways? I mean, are they invested in the stock market or 401ks and, yes. and all that? Okay. Yes. Okay. So it's not a matter of they don't invest, but it's a matter of they're not willing to, and I don't say not willing to, whether it be fear or whatever that barrier is, they're just not in the, the real estate thing. Uh, they're, which yeah, is, their, their money's in 401ks, in not cash flowing assets, which is what I keep preaching. It's okay if you want your money in 401ks and the stock market, et cetera. And then I, what I like to say, and I, I have some money in the stock market, not a lot. It's diminished over the years as I've become more comfortable with my real estate and you know, my own portfolio. But you know, I always say to them, tell me how the stock market works. Like, really, do you really understand the stock market? 
<laughs> and, you know, do you understand that tomorrow when you go into Chipotle and there's bad lettuce that the stock can drop $5 a share? So, you know, you have way more control over a strip center or an apartment building or, you know, five twin homes. And that's, and that's what, why I'm doing the symposium. I literally have eight women. I have one woman who just bought her first shopping center. I've got myself who I own six, but in my career has, have owned over 12. I have another woman that built, that developed a marina and some residential townhouses. I have another woman who has owned 28 coach homes in Wichita, Kansas. I have another woman who invested in a restaurant, a hotel, and single family. So I'm, I'm just per, literally parading these women on stage, and I'm going to do fireside chats with each of them. And I, I want, I'm going to say, tell this audience of women who want to invest but are, are a little afraid. You know, were you afraid? It's going to be my first question. And they're all going to say, yeah, I mean, I was afraid. Okay, how did you get over your fear? And let's go step by step to how you got where you are today. So I've got, and I've got one woman who runs a big real estate company, so she can't actively manage real estate. She's in 42 passive real estate investments. So I just, my, and I'm gonna have banners around the room, Darren, that say, if we can do it, so can you. Because I, I truly believe that 80% of it is mindset. No, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the whole, j just the nature of doing something that you're not, you've never done, you, you don't have the experience and there, there, you wouldn't be human if you did not have some sort of uh, fear or trepidation about, you know, jumping off the pier when you've never, never done that because you've never landed uh, on your feet or, you know, you, you've heard right. about the horror stories. I mean, I know uh, myself, I can remember just, there's a level of anxiety. I don't care what the deal is. There's excitement going up to the deal, but at the closing, there's a, a matter of, did I, did I check everything twice? You know, did, is this, you know, this, what about right. that? What about that? And, and, and there's a point where I've learned, you just, you got, okay, I've done all that I can. There are going to be some things I hadn't anticipated. We'll get through it. We're going forward. And, uh, you know, you hope you have a little bit of time before they all start coming undone. But, um, but I think that the thing that I have learned more uh, recently, and, and it's kind of has to do kind of more of generationally, is that uh, having parents that are retired and watching them and how their 401k works. Um, this is the fundamental thing that I, I recognize between real estate and, you know, stock markets. If, you, if you're buying a stock and, and the hope is that it goes up in value, how do you get that value? You have to sell the, you have to sell the asset, right? Real estate, you're, you're creating, you're buying something that produces cash from day one. You don't have to sell the asset and the asset continues to increase in value. And that fundamental concept, and just as a, I mean, just the, the if there's nothing more simple and more clear to recognize that you'll never have to worry about the running out of money or, you know, living out, living your money kind of thing, uh, but looking at it from like an end game kind of thing, as opposed to, you know, the, the fear, but starting from the, the back end of like, okay, you want the good life. How long do you, how long of a runway do you think you have? I mean, there's that, that uh, commercial on TV about how much money do you need to retire? You know, and a lot of people ask, uh, or they answer, I don't know, you know? And, yeah. and, uh, and I've got a friend says, that's probably a pretty accurate answer. I don't know. Right. You know, but um, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on just, just that fundamental understanding, like you said, that people, they invest in the stock market, but don't really understand the stock market. Do you believe that they understand how they get their money out of the stock market? Absolutely not. So basically it's a herd mentality, right? Uh, it, for 50 years, people have been investing in the stock market and pension funds are invested in the stock market and their parents invested in the stock market. And there's, you know, in, in the horror stories of people who invested in real estate with sharks and got taken advantage of, those are the things that come to people's minds because the positive stories about real estate investments aren't shared. So, so it's the easier way. Well, my parents did it. My grandparents did it. My financial advisor's suggesting it. You know, your financial advisor, has he, has he ever invested in real estate? No. So you're getting advice from someone that doesn't even know, you know, that hasn't done this other option, which is why I think it's so important that people 
that have invested and are successful invest, investing share the story. So I don't think they know how they get it out at all. And I don't think they understand that if you invest in a cash flowing asset, you know, not only is your principal safe, but you're getting cash <laughs> every year to build it up to even having a greater principal while you're paying the principal off. It's, it, it, it's a lack. And I think people think it's so complicated that they don't want to, it's too hard to learn. And it's not. Well, and even uh, to your point uh, of some of your um, speakers, uh, the number of opportunities to invest passively. Um, exactly. You don't have to be the person that goes out and finds the deal. In fact, the person that finds the deal usually needs to have investors to pull off the deal because it's not, um, and I think that's something that uh, I don't think is widely understood. I think if, if people have a, a, uh, um, a relationship to real estate as a home, and they know what a home is because they live in a home and they understand what a, an expense that was to purchase. Uh, maybe they're not able to think beyond that. I know myself, I just, when I first started, I, I bought other single family homes because I knew what they were and I knew what they were supposed to do. Cash flow was like, what? I mean, I'd never even, how could you possibly make anything cash flow? I was, I was feeding everything of, you know, a little bit at the, at the, the beginning there. Um, and it wasn't until I actually bought something that actually truly cash flowed. And I was going, holy moly, this really works. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to have that aha. But um, I, I, I just wonder if, if it's, you know, kind of like what we've said is that they, they know people who have done the stock market. They don't understand the stock market, but they know people have done the stock market. So you start from that kind of a reference point. Now they, they, they still don't understand the stock market and they don't understand how they're going to get their money out of the stock market. And the concern of outliving their money uh, has not crept up yet. Mm -hmm. Because I think that, you know, a, as we continue to age, you know, I don't know what the, the charts are, but I think that, you know, uh, statistically, if you live past a certain age and you don't have any kind of disease uh, in your family or in your genetic makeup, there's nothing that really prevents you from reaching a hundred years uh, of age just based on, you know, improved nutrition and, and lifestyle and just the, the medical community. I mean, it, it may be uh, quite a yeoman's effort to keep you alive to a hundred, but there's, but the technology exists in most cases. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, most of the, uh, the, the information when I, have experienced the uh, the meeting with the uh, the stockbroker. They, they go basically to the mortality tables and say, well, you know, you, you know, give a few years, and you know, and and as you keep going, if the the values don't keep going up, or if there is a correction or whatever, you know, all of a sudden now you're selling at a discount to get your cash flow. Um, it's not a pretty not a pretty way to end. Exactly, exactly, but, and I, and I, you know, certainly. I, what I say to people, I, I, I do a lot of posting on social media and I talk to groups and, and commercial real estate, we're slow, you know, the residential real estate industry has embraced social media significantly better than commercial. And I, I speak to commercial groups and I, I say to them, I say to them the same thing that I say to people, look, we didn't know how to drive either, right? <laughs> but we figured it out. And with practice, we got pretty good at it. So I think that whether it's investing in real estate, if you're interested in, in investing in real estate, then listen to podcasts like this, read people's books that talk about investing in real estate, talk to your friends and ask, who do you know that invests in real estate? Call and talk to them and just start familiarizing yourself with people that are doing it and people that are talking about it and people that are teaching it. because. I think knowledge can mitigate the feeling of risk. And no. then practicing. You know, when I go out to family and friends and say, I'm looking at a new deal, I'm going to raise $2 million. You know, if someone calls and says, I'm going to give 100, I'll say, great. If you lost 100, is it going to change your life? Because, you know, there's risk in everything. And they'll go, oh, yeah, I wouldn't want to lose 100. I said, well, then just give me 50. This is your first deal with me. The first time you're investing with me, I'd rather you give me half of what you would like to give me so that I feel better, you feel better. You know, it's, it's not as big of an impact if the deal goes south, which can happen. 
So that's one of the ways that when, when I have new investors that haven't made, you know, that haven't seen the success we've had, I don't want them to be nervous. Give me half of what you're comfortable giving. And then now it's, it might just be a rounding error if there's a problem. Hopefully it's not a problem, but you know, we're, we're not all perfect. Sure. No, and I think there's that kind of fundamental understanding of the market. I mean, they wouldn't think twice about putting the money in the stock market, but just that, you know, they know, they know who Beth is and uh, you know, there's, you don't want to create a difficult situation that doesn't need to be created. You want to be real and, and make certain that they understand that there is risk uh, and uh, you know, be transparent to that. Um, Beth, I, in, in thinking this, uh, through as far as the the audience and listeners and how many of them are investors. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to them as far as what, how they can appeal to a, a woman investor or, or what they can do to help a woman investor. Um, I mean, we've talked about, you know, they, you know, they basically they need to, the knowledge uh, to, to have a, a base, but I'm just wondering, is there anything that uh, if there's an investor out there that has, a uh, an opportunity and and has uh, not thought to uh, reach out or you know I, I'm not saying that they would have done it uh, based on an exclusionary practice but they just they haven't thought to really try and tap into the uh, women's network or just women you know is there anything you can point well, to that I think I I think that you know looking in their circles of you know in their in their own circles of influence. And if they already have maybe one woman investor, ask that person, do they, does she have any friends that might be interested in investing and set up a meeting with that woman and one of two of her friends, especially if that woman investor that they already have with that, um, that um, sponsor has had success. So I think that that's one way to, you know, just reach out or, I just think in, in those types of circles and just letting people know that it's not, if you have any friends, women or men that are interested in investing, there's, I, I get calls all the time from men and women, but I will tell you that the women that call me say, you know, I never hear of these deals. So I just think being open and saying, if there's anyone that you know that might be interested in investing, you know, please let me know. I have, I have an aunt of a couple of mine that she invests. She's a single woman and I think she lives in Arkansas and she's one of my investors. So I think that there are people in their inner circles that know people that would like to invest and, and diversify. So I just think it's, it's just spreading the word. I'm looking for investors and it doesn't have to be, you know, a white male attorney in the high rise of downtown Chicago, you know? Right, right. Right. Now, I, I, um, I think, you know, again, what I, I continue to just on personal experience and kind of recognizing is that if you don't have a sense of or knowledge of, or, you know, you don't have a, an understanding of the opportunity and how it works. Um, but I think the question that I would come back to is, do you know how what you're doing works? Cause I think that really, it, it, you know, the, the whole stock market idea is like, uh, yeah, what do you mean? How does it work? You know, kind of like, well, how does exactly. it work? Exactly. You know, how does it with, work? Yesterday, yeah. Chipotle was worth 20, 29 a share. Now there's this E. coli thing with lettuce again. You walk into Chipotle, there's a big sign and the stock is 22 a day later. How, how does that work? Okay. Right. <laughs> that, there, if you think you have, well, I don't want to invest in real estate because I don't have any control. Well, you don't have any control with the stock market either. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and, that, and we haven't even talked about the opportunity to improve the value on real estate and what you can do. I mean, you know, whether it be uh, uh, leasing up the property or increasing rents or decreasing expenses or, you know, any of that stuff. So yeah, or repurposing. Yeah. I bought a, a 1970s two-story office building and I convinced Starbucks and the city to allow me to build a Starbucks in the parking lot of the office building while we decrease the occupancy of the office building so that by the time Starbucks opened, the office building would be empty and we just demolished the office building. And now I have the two acres that the office building sat on ready to develop and getting ready to open my new Starbucks. 
So there's all kinds of ways to increase the value of functionally obsolete real estate. Yeah, no, and, and just having that creative mindset of, of the opportunity, kind of a blank canvas. That's, that's awesome. Well, congratulations to you on that. That sounds exciting. Thank you. Beth, if we could, I uh, want to shift gears. Um, I mentioned to you before we started recording that uh, by day I'm an insurance broker and uh, primarily work with real estate investors. And uh, as such, we, we try and employ risk management as a, a strategy to identify and, and uh, manage the risk that they have. And uh, there's three strategies that we typically look to. And the first is, can we avoid the risk? Uh, if we can't avoid it, is there a way we can minimize the risk? And then lastly, we look to see, okay, if we can't minimize it, is there a way we can transfer the risk? And that's where insurance comes in. That's what a, an insurance policy is, is a risk transfer um, method of managing the risk. And uh, so as of late, I've been asking all of my guests uh, if they could look in their sphere and see what, what they can identify as the biggest risk. And uh, so with that, I'd like to ask you, Beth Azor, what is the biggest risk? I think the biggest risk is lack of knowledge. And we luckily live in a world where we can mitigate that, but that does take time and effort and work to do so. So, and you don't know what you don't know. So, when I was building my, when I developed my first shopping center, which was about five years ago, I bought, I bought a strip club and knocked it down and built a strip center. The, the municipality loved me, but I had never built anything before. And I was very nervous and I, and I had one partner in that deal. And I kept telling him, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. He said, don't worry, you'll figure it out. But I hired people that did know what they were doing to consult with me and teach me. And I read a lot of books. I listened to podcasts. So the biggest risk is the lack of education, but particularly you don't know what you don't know. And being wise and astute. And I'm, I'm just a big believer in continually learning. I probably listen to three or four podcasts a day and I'm constantly reading. So, um, so that's how I mitigate that potential lack of knowledge. And that helps, but there's things, you know, our retail industry is going to be just lambasted by self-driving cars. So I'm fascinated and I'm reading all about that because if I, I'm 59, so if in the next 10 years, the self-driving car thing happens, our industry is gonna shift again. So I'm trying to stay on top of it, but I don't know what I don't know. And so that's how I mitigate it. So that's the biggest risk, not knowing what you don't know. I love it. There's uh, plenty for that, uh, or plenty of opportunity to learn more. And uh, you know, I, I've always kind of uh, enjoyed the fact that if you're not, you're not learning, you're not growing uh, yes. kind of thing, you know? And, and uh, so I'm um, hats off. I, I totally, uh, I'm in agreement. Uh, and that's, I think it also, it helps you uh, mitigate, I don't want to say mitigate the risk, but it just, it gives me um, encouragement that I, I do know now something, I understand how something works and I'm not afraid to take that risk. Um, so I think that's, that's awesome. And also it, it opens up conversations, like you said, with whether it be people you hire or whatever, but you just, you know, kind of learn how to fit the, the puzzle together more. So mm -hmm. that's awesome. Beth, uh, before we close up here, where can the listeners go if they'd like to learn more or connect with you? So Beth Azor on LinkedIn is probably where I'm most active. I have a website, BethAzor.com as well. Um, I'm on Instagram and Facebook, all Beth Azor, B-E-T-H-A-Z-O-R. Got it. Well, Beth, I uh, can't say thanks enough for uh, taking the time to talk. I've learned a lot and enjoyed it and I uh, hope we can do it again soon. Thank you, Darren, for having me and thank you to your listeners. All right. For our listeners, if you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Remember, the more you know, the more you grow. That's all we've got this week. Until next time, thanks for listening to Commercial Real Estate Pro Network's C-R-E-P-N 
Radio.